The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Yeah, okay, so I guess. Uh, no, no, wait, know, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> He's joking. Please, I'm, joking. I'm gonna I'm mute joking. ourselves over here so people can hear you clearly. All right. No, 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 it's fine. You guys jump in whenever you want. Um, a lot of price action, yeah. and uh, sometimes I can, you know, ramble on. So <clears throat> feel free to jump in anytime you want. Um, okay, so we're looking here at the Monero chart. Um, I just wanted to get get us a kind of a bird's eye picture of where things are from basically 2017. We've got this big rising um, support line that kind of broke down in the past couple months. And basically, uh, we're, we're bumping up against that line again. You, you can also see this line right here is kind of a secondary support line that's, that's been in play for about the past year and a half. So um, that's kind of the big picture. You can see that we've broken down the main, uh, the main uh, falling sort of uh, falling resistance, broken through that months ago. Um, so, you know, price right here on Monero would appear to be neutral, but this kind of very long-term action is, is what you call consolidation at the bottom. And um, I mean, you would look at this and say, hey, this chart does have the opportunity um, to, to make a big pump, just like from a purely technical standpoint, um, for getting all the fundamentals. So zooming in a bit here on the daily, um, I think it was last week, you know, we had had this big, uh, this big green dildo to the upside. We had some very interesting price action this week where we took, let's just take a look at this. Things just like flash crashed um, almost 10%, about 8% there. And this happened like in the matter of maybe two hours, one hour. Yeah, this, this this flash crash happened in a matter of one hour, and it was kind of something that had happened across the board, um, across all crypto assets. You can kind of see this on Bitcoin. Maybe if we go down to the one hour here, um, I believe it was right here. It was this same crash. You'll notice the Bitcoin crash was only like five and a half percent. We can look at the Monero. Let's go to Monero Bitcoin. You can look at this also in terms of Monero versus Bitcoin, and that was this candle right here as well. Where um, where it just just took a big dump. So one thing I did today uh, or yesterday or a few days ago was to take the XMR BTC chart and then run a correlation analysis compared to total. So the total market cap of crypto. And one thing that I thought was interesting is that the ratio of XMR to BTC is basically inversely correlated to how well crypto is doing. And we've talked about this. We've seen this anecdotally, but but again, you know, it's it's like it's always good to try and do some kind of mathematical analysis to confirm the thing that you think you're seeing. Because sometimes stuff can appear, it can feel like things are a certain way, but it's not really quite as prominent as you would think. Um, but in this case, we can see that since basically the middle of uh, 2022, the middle of last year, um, if the crypto market is going down, Monero BTC ratio is going up. And if the crypto market is going up, um, the BTC, the XMR BTC ratio is going down. That's what, so you'll see this is negative one down here on the bottom. Negative one means inversely correlated. So this is interesting because we haven't quite seen this action um, through the lifetime of, of Monero's history. You'll notice that for the most part, um, okay, there's been some positive correlations earlier um, right here where, okay, if the, if the market is going up, the XMR BTC ratio is going up, um, but it's largely been up, down, up, down. And when you're oscillating around the zero point like that, it basically means no correlation. But this right here is definitely correlation. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that we talk about often. If we think the crypto market is going to be broadly positive, don't expect the ratio to be performing that well. So um, let's take a look a little bit more at the uh, some of the pleb lines here, some of the uh, easy ways to draw the chart. So um, basically, we've got this broadening structure here, right, where we kind of got this lower line that's sort of kind of a support. We break down, but usually come back above it. But things are kind of trending down here. Um, and I'm not really too convinced that this is going to make a big comeback anytime soon. Right now, markets continue looking fairly positive. Um, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, breaking certain levels uh, was going to force me to reevaluate my sort of down through the end of year hypothesis. That kind of happened um, about, let's just say, a week and a half ago. So, um, but at any rate, uh, Monero is still benefiting from the broad positive movement in crypto. I would like to see a little bit better price performance. Um, right now but um you know i would expect monero to continue to generally trend with the crypto market um in weird fits and starts right monero will pump earlier and then it'll you know flatten out or kind of go down when other things are going up and then it'll be doing nothing and then suddenly it'll pump out of nowhere when nothing else is pumping um that's just kind of the action that we've seen on monero historically now for the past year or so at least for the past year or so one thing that i think does happen 
I'm starting to believe, and especially, I don't know if you guys saw the CZ tweet where he kind of actually said some good stuff about Monero. And I figure, you know, even criminals need privacy, uh, especially criminals. So anyways, um, I think it's very likely that a lot of these big players are chain hopping through Monero and they use those opportunities to fuck with the price. And I also think that it's possible that, um, so let's get, get into some price news here. BlackRock, and I'm skipping around, but this will all come together here in a second. BlackRock iShares filed for an ETH trust in Delaware. What this means is that they're basically preparing to um, to request an ETH uh, an ETH um, ETF soon. So that's the speculation. I mean, it's really you know, do you really have to speculate? Not too much. They actually did file for the trust. This is coming when they filed for the Bitcoin ETF. We knew that uh, that ETH ETF was going to be coming around the corner as well. So I wonder if there isn't with big pros uh, big positive moves in different crypto coins. These guys do reposition the big whales. They reposition the insiders. They, they kind of change their stack, their play as they know what's about to unfold in the crypto market. So I think that they do some amount of chain hopping through Monero. It's probably not massive. It could just be like their personal stacks, you know, like perhaps CZ or Justin Sun or, or some of these guys. I would be willing to bet that these guys in their own personal stack reposition, not just their corporate stack that they're managing, but their own personal stack. I bet they that these guys reposition their own stuff. I bet they chain hop through Monero and I bet this is that this is often used as a way to kind of like fuck with the price so that you can sort of like um, hit the stops on the places that Monero is traded, some places where it might be leverage traded. That's kind of just like my personal theory. Um, but I, I think that, that that's likely that that's happening. So um, yeah, that's kind of where Monero's at at the moment. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at Bitcoin since as they call it the God market, the daddy coin of all the other coins. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look, look at the big broad view as well. You can kind of see, okay, we had this, this triangle down here that got broken to the upside. Right now, you can see the very long term, not very, very long term, but you know, like for the past year, you can see that we've had this sort of uh, this rising triangle. Let's just draw it out here. This guy, not very straight lines I drew, but that triangle right here, you can see that, that Bitcoin is basically kind of in this zone right here. Um, that's going to be pretty hard resistance. Like that's going to be some stiff resistance. That doesn't mean it can't get broken. And one thing that, that I want you guys to keep in mind is that in a, in a bullish scenario, in a broadly bullish scenario, um, especially in a strongly bullish scenario, you break rising resistance to the top side. So for example, if we were to go down to the shorter time frame here on Bitcoin, this is now the one hour chart. Maybe we'll flip to the two hour chart so that it's easier to see. So basically Bitcoin made this big pump and has kind of been trending sideways. It's been trending up and up and it basically just broke through. I say just, you know, it was a couple of days ago, but um, the market is still a little bit uncertain. It looks like whether this is a real break or a fake out break, but Bitcoin did break through rising resistance right here. That is inherently bullish. Like from a charting perspective, that is inherently bullish absent some kind of like major problems in the macro or some kind of like clear fake out issues going on or other counter signals. Right now, we don't see other counter signals. We're not seeing anything in the short term that would say this market is problematic. This market is going to crash. Um, we now have broad positivity in some of the macro stuff as well. So let's take a look here at the NASDAQ, for example. The NASDAQ just broke out of what we what we mentioned um, last week was looked a lot like a bullish flag. So, um, you know what, I'm going to turn off the liquidity here for a second. I don't want it to be too much of an eyesore. So we said, okay, this big move to the upside, we're now in this sort of downward channel. <clears throat> and this looks a lot like a bullish flag. There's a little bit of a fake out down here. Now things have broken to the upside. So one thing that, uh, that we need to look at in terms of liquidity is the reverse repos. And the reverse repos have basically gone from, from a peak of two and a half trillion now below a trillion dollars. So that's one and a half trillion dollars that left the reverse repo market and went somewhere, right? It looks pretty clear to me that, that this money has gone into stocks. This money is likely going into crypto as well. Um, if if we expect that BlackRock and the insiders and the ETF, yada, yada, et cetera, are getting into crypto, this is this is on the verge of being, being like a true mainstream investment now. Anyone can invest in it. Grandma, you know, um, <laughs> Your, your pension funds, et cetera, can now, like when the ETF gets approved, because it's, I mean, it's hard to believe that it's just not going to get approved at this point. Everything points that direction. Um, and it could be as early as next year. Um, there's there's people that are saying that, like, I think it was BlackRock, some BlackRock representative said, like, by January 10th. Who knows, right? It might not be January. Maybe it's March. Maybe it's May. But it's, it's going to get approved at some point. 
the the SEC, just from a from a pure legal hat standpoint, the SEC has been capricious. They have not applied the rules consistently. That even judges are now saying that. So the SEC just doesn't have much of a leg to stand on here. They're going to have to approve this thing eventually, even if they can put up some more bullshit resistance. And the market kind of knows that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so we've got the reverse repos here. They continue to fall. This thing still has another trillion dollars that could hypothetically get pumped into the market. Um, so we can go ahead and come back here to the NASDAQ. Let's turn on the liquidity. So you'll notice here that the white line, that's that's global liquidity across the board. So M2, uh, M2 money supply of all the different major currencies. Like it, it, this white line accounts for like 99% of the global market cap of, of currencies. Um, so that's um, M2. And then that's also the balance sheets of various um uh, of various uh, banks. So the green line then is U.S. liquidity. It's just like solely U.S. liquidity. And <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, I guess something went wrong with my throat today. Anyways, so the green line is U.S. liquidity. And this thing continues to move to the upside. One thing that I incorporated into this uh, this past week is the U.S. Treasury balance sheet. We want to incorporate that in the calculation because um, at the time when I made this script, it didn't matter because their, their balance sheet was so low and it kind of oscillated between, you know, like 500 billion or something like that um, or a, a few hundred billion. But they've been printing so much money now that like they, they just keep adding like trillions every quarter, like a trillion here, a trillion there. Like every few months, they're adding a, another trillion or so to the balance sheet. And so that money has to get spent somewhere. The government's going to spend that somewhere, typically into corporations, which is going to improve their balance sheet. It's going to improve the corporate profits, which, of course, is going to improve the stock market. So. Um, we still kind of, in, we still look like we're in this situation of, oh, where, where did it go? Uh, here we go. We're still in the situation with the bond market where, um, you know, things are inverted, things are not normal, but somehow they've been able to, to keep things, uh, inverted and not normal for quite a long time here. It looks like they got interest rates off the floor to five over 5%. That's like basically a miracle that they didn't crash the economy doing that. Maybe there's still something coming next year. I would kind of be surprised if there isn't. It doesn't have to be like a not like a 9/11 or a or a 2008 style crash. I still just think it makes sense for some kind of big washout to happen before the next bull market happens or begins in earnest. Um, if if for no other reason than then you want to clear out all of the longs, clear out the leverage longs, hit those stops, liquidate people, crash things to the downside, get the opportunity to position yourself and then move for another year's long bull market. Um, but who knows when that happens, right? The bond market is not saying that crash is going to happen anytime in the immediate future, like the immediate future. Um, and we're not seeing anything overall in the macro that says that that says things are terrible. Um, the Dixie right now continues, the dollar index continues to look like it's in this bullish flag. So from a charting perspective, you would expect this to break to the upside and then head for this area right here. When that happens, I don't know, but it's starting to get a little bit long in the tooth. So um, perhaps that doesn't happen, but from a pure like pleb line TA standpoint, you would you would expect that to happen. And then from a pure kind of um, statistical standard deviation analysis, wave magic, you would say that the prominent long-term standard deviations are up here in the 108, 109 area. So. Um, these standard deviations, by the way, are not necessarily hard resistance. This is not like, oh, you touched the line and now it's going to get rejected off the line. It's an area. It, it actually ends up acting a little bit more like this. You can often see something pop up above the standard deviation like this, hang out, and then come back down. So you just have to understand that, that these are not hard resistance lines uh, in that sense. They're more like target zones, and, and that's really the way you have to, you have to treat it. So... Uh, let's see. I wanted to also show you guys another little script I was playing with um, this morning, trying to expand. These are Z-scores. And remember, Z-scores tell you how the asset is doing relative to its own history. So it basically normalizes everything to a zero point, right? If it's zero, it means the asset hasn't been changing. Um, some assets like Monero, like stable coins like Monero, uh, tend to have very low volatility. So if it pumps let's say 50% for Monero, that's a pretty big move. Like the very, that's, a, that's a massive move considering the past year of our price action. Whereas something like FTT token, for example, the, uh, uh, the FTX, you know, Sam Bankman's like primary token there for their exchange, that thing has had shitloads of volatility, mostly to the downside. Um, so this thing pumped massively. Like um, I want to say it's been like a 4X or almost a 5X now. So anyways, but the idea here is to look at how an asset is performing relative to its own history so that you can kind of see which ones are, are performing, which ones are not. Um, right now, 
in order to do that, you have to look back a certain amount of time. So we are looking back 100 candles. And since we're on the daily, that would be 100 day. Uh, we could change that. You know, maybe maybe we could even change that to a year. Let's go 365 and, and see what pops out here. But ultimately, the things that I want to show you here that Link continues to perform. Um, Link has basically been a top performer. And um, TRX, Tron, has also been another top performer. And this should be unsurprising. Stable coins are sort of the, uh, let's just call them the lifeblood of the crypto liquidity marketplace, um, exchange marketplace. Um, and the fact that so much Tron or so much Tether <clears throat> gets issued on top of Tron, it basically tells you that Tron is going to be supported by insiders. So you can expect that Tron is probably going to continue to perform in any bull market scenario. Um, the laggards have been BNB token. Um, Dogecoin has actually been kind of lagging as well, although it's starting to catch up now. Um, obviously Matic Litecoin is down there as well. Um, and then XMR has been kind of middle of the pack, although where is it? I don't see it on here. I see it on the right, but where is, I probably messed up the colors cause I was like fiddling with it right before we started here. But anyways, um, yeah, like for me personally, like I told you guys for a long time, um, Link was kind of this like outside play of insurance against me being wrong. Like I thought the market, you know, my my overall thought was okay. The market looks uh, on balance of probabilities down. Even if not, I want to protect my stack. But here's some cash into Link. If Link does well, then cool. You know, I'm still I'm still making making money in the gains game. So, um, anyways, Link is good. I'm probably gonna take profit there, maybe around 17 or 18. That would be my personal um, spot there for Link, just to you know, just for some shit coinery. Um, let's take a look at ETH BTC. Uh, for some people, they would call this even further shit coinery. Um, as we talked about this, this very long term, let's go to the weekly. This very long term um, support line got tagged. Uh, this thing is from 2017, right, guys? So this is a five year support line. You're not just going to break this line down. Typically, rarely, are you just going to like crash through this kind of big support line like that? Um, you're going to get at least uh, an interim bounce, which is kind of what we're seeing. Um, and especially given the fact that uh, BlackRock iShares looks like they're going to be filing for their ETF, um, you got a pretty good move there. Let's take a look relative to Bitcoin. That was a that was about a 12% move. So pretty good. Um, ETH is catching up. It definitely was doing worse for a while. Um, I personally think that again, like ETH is likely to break through back into this range and then move to the upside. I think that ETH and Tron are where Tether and USDC are issued. It's like, it's just a no brainer to me. Like whether you like ETH or you don't, it's, it's just a coin that's, that's probably going to be regarded, um, importantly in the crypto ecosystem for, for quite a long period of time. So, uh, I don't think I have too much else for you guys. We, uh, we could look at hypothetically the Bitcoin versus the stock market. You can see it still looks positive. Um, you know, one thing maybe we should do also is, is, um, take a look at the Bitcoin wave magic. I just want to show you guys the statistical levels. While that's loading, we'll take a look at, at Bitcoin dominance. So um, you can see that uh, you know Bitcoin basically broke above this sort of rising resistance. But now that the market is generally in the positive mood, you're going to see the shitcoins continue to perform. You're going to see new shitcoins continue to perform. I believe Sol was another top performer. There have been um, there have been proposals. I think they're still highly tentative, but there are proposals now for people that want to buy FTX, the platform. Um, FTX people are going to get made whole at some point here. Like, no, sorry, scratch that. Excuse me. Not made whole. FTX people are going to get paid back in some portion. They're going to get some amount of money back. They've been finding billions here, billion there. Um, so you're going to see some repayment there. And the uh, with the Sam Bankman trial being over, he, he still has to get sentenced, but that won't be till like March of next year. But with that whole thing kind of like looking like it's ending, people are getting optimistic on the comeback, FTT, Soul, et cetera, whatever. Um, I think they're both shit coins, but um, it, it, Soul is an interesting idea the way they do their mining, but um, I'm not sure that I like their implementation necessarily. And I'm not convinced that that way of mining is really uh, the best way to do it. Anyways, okay, so that's Bitcoin dominance. I wouldn't necessarily expect a bunch of performance there, but the crypto market, you know, is when it's bullish, it can start doing crazy things. Okay, now here's what I wanted to show you with the um, with the wave magic, with the standard deviation analysis. I just wanted to point out again, um, these very long-term standard deviation levels, the, the upper blue bands. Um, I know this chart's kind of messy and it's kind of taking a moment to load. We probably don't have much more time here. Um, yeah, okay, so this will have to do right here. This will have to do for now. So basically these upper standard deviation bands get set when price starts expanding, when price starts moving significantly to the upside or to the downside, 
it means that the standard deviation of the running past, let's just say 100 days or 1,000 days or 50 days or, or, or 4,000 days, right? The standard deviation of all of those price points, all of those candles of the past X amount of days starts to expand when price starts to get volatile. And that's what these lines are. That's what the blue lines are. That's what the orange lines are. Blue is the upper standard deviation. Orange is the lower standard deviation. Don't worry about the red and the purple lines. Actually, let me just mute those. Um, they're a derivative of standard deviation. Um, but anyways, the point of this chart is to show you guys that yes, things feel markedly bullish here. This is your take profit area. Like if you're in a long trade, if you've kept your, your long-term trading stack in play, even if you like are the kind of person that only reallocates funds every so often and rebalances your portfolio, maybe you try and target percentages, you know, and that's, that's actually a very easy um, way to keep your portfolio balanced when you have massive gains on some asset and it, you know, maybe you had 5% of your asset, your, your funds in some asset, and then it becomes like 20% of your stack will rebalance that, right? Like right now I'm looking at kind of a situation with link for me that that's doing a little bit of that. You want to rebalance that. So these upper standard deviation levels are very long-term levels. We could also just kind of like drop some basic lines here. So for example, this horizontal line that I just laid down, that's another spot um, that was kind of like the rebound back in uh, March of 2022, April 2022. That was like the top rebound off of the top. That is like a perfect spot to look at and think, okay, maybe it's time to take some profit. Now, you could take some profit, you can pull some chips off, off the table, and then you can just wait for some kind of like modest pullback. You could just wait for 16% down, right? And then get back in. If you're really nervous about not being in the market, um, again, you know, I like to play things by ear. We're looking at long term. If this thing just shoots up in the next week or so to these upper standard deviation bands, like do yourself a favor and take something off the table, take some profit, right? Just a little bit. Um, I'm not saying to trade, but you know, even DCA HODL is a kind of a trade. So um, yeah, those are the kinds of things to be watching out for. Bitcoin looks markedly uh, positive. The whole market looks fairly positive. Um, if you've got some shit coins, be looking at the opportunities to, um, you know, to take some profits. Um, and, uh, you know, good luck, everyone. Hope you guys have fun at the, uh, at, uh, the conference.